This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the podcast, I have Perry Kaufman. He's an American systematic trader, index developer, and quantitative financial theorist. He is considered a leading expert in the development of fully algorithmic trading programs. As the author of 12 books, Perry brings wisdom on the subject of systematic trading. And for me, 250 episodes into my podcast series, this is one of my favorites. I do hope you enjoy this episode. Also, at the very beginning, as you jump into our conversation, I'm referencing Perry's background. Before he was a trader, he was involved in the aerospace industry. Check out his Wikipedia entry. Very interesting. Again, I hope you enjoy this episode. Perry. Perry, Mike Covell. Hello, Mike Covell. You're are you in Hong Kong or somewhere out there? <laughs> I like I like the some the somewhere out there. Uh, perhaps looking back to your early early work before you got involved in trading, maybe really out there, maybe like way out in the space the space <laughs> <Yeah>. either. <laughs> yes, it's it's true. I was just talking to somebody about the fact that there was a time when I did after Gemini, I did interstellar navigation, which never got applied to anything. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the the government does all these uh, advanced things, and someday they get used, and someday it's, they don't. Yeah, that must have been uh, must have been quite fun early experiences, I can only imagine. Oh, you know, for a young person, 23, 24, whatever, it is so exciting to work on... You know, the space program at that time, it was just just where you wanted to be. It was it was the top top of the heap of innovation. I mean, you were right there at the cutting edge of seeing everything, right? Yeah, you know, it's funny because these days when we do an index fund and we publish it, the government requires that we have two sources of data and two calculations that match to 10 decimal places. And we got the man on the moon with two decimal places. <laughs> so, I don't understand you know, why they need 10 decimal places. Well, I, I think we all know the answer to that, and it's not a pretty answer. It's not a rational answer, but it's not pretty either. Hey, to answer your question, I'm in Saigon tonight. Oh, Saigon, how interesting. I yeah. always wanted to go to Vietnam. I understand it's really a wonderful place. It still has some of that, uh, how shall I say, uh, old world charm a little bit there. So it's it's nice compared to some of the Asian cities that have taken off and feel like New York, perhaps. Well, yes, like Singapore that uh, f- tore down all their old stuff until they got to the last street. Yeah. And then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> decided that, oh, my God, we better leave something. It's amazing what they've done in Singapore, but it's it's a little uh, antiseptic. They need some soul, and I tell my Singaporean friends that. You guys need soul. Yeah, I know. It's so Western, it's uh, scary. Yeah. I mean, occasionally you have the nice food courts, you know, that give you at least a flavor of, of culture there. But still, it's yeah. not quite the same as old buildings and yeah. things like that. Little dirty, little gritty, like Saigon. Hey, listen, let me jump right in. I want to get you to go a little back in time before we jump into where you're at currently today. But I was thinking, at some point in time, you must have had either a mentor in person or a mentor's writings, or did you just come to the idea of 100% algorithmic trading systems on your lonesome? Well, it wasn't much of a leap. I mean, I was a mathematician math and physics background, and then some considerable work in astronomy. I I do everything with formulas, and I was in the first wave of computer programmers. I was just really lucky. I went to the University of Wisconsin, started in 61, 
and they had an army research center with a big computer that they allowed the students to use. And so, you know, given that, I never thought about doing it any other way. It just was computerized. I did, you know, back in those days, there were only agricultural markets. And so I learned a lot about agriculture and supply and demand and basis trades and things. But the idea of being like fundamental trader where I watch the basis, all these people that are successful traders are systematic in some way. You know, my wife is a successful trader and she is very systematic, but she's not automated. It's not much of a leap to go from systematic to automated. And, and it's so much easier to then prove that your stuff works even retrospectively. It's, a, you know, if it doesn't work in the past, it seems that I wouldn't be using it now. I, I understand that if it does work in the past, it's not a guarantee it'll work in the future. But certainly the other way around is important to me. It, it has to work. It has to work through different markets and all that. Anyway. It was just a natural thing. So, and I've seen you say this where, you know, many people, they'll get a hold of TradeStation and they'll just start throwing in systems, throwing in portfolios, crunching numbers. But I think sometimes they don't take a step back and actually think about what the purpose is. And I've seen you make the comment, I'd like for you to elaborate on this. For you, it wasn't as much about, and still to this day, as much as optimization as opposed to validation. So you would come up with the idea and say, you know, okay, I can see how this can happen in the markets. Then you would build a system, test it, and look at parameters. I don't know if a lot of traders approach it that way. Oh, I think that experienced traders have an idea how to exploit the market successfully. You know, the floor traders have their own game. They, they'll trade front to back months. They'll, they'll do things. They'll look for certain things coming up. They'll trade after a report. You know, they'll wait for a report and then trade the opposite way. They, they all seem to have found a way that works for them reasonably consistently. And that's, that's the sound premise. You know, you all need a sound premise that's done either by understanding the economics of what's going on or just by observing the way the market reacts. And once you understand that and you've tried a little bit by hand, then you can go and automate that and see if it works, really works over a broader set of markets and see what your risk issues are. I think that's the biggest advantage of testing is not to alter the concept, but to find out what the risk really is so that you can treat in a way that doesn't wipe yourself out, you know, not over leverage. You can expect enough, uh, enough, well, you can understand what the downside is and, and account for it. Anyway, it's an issue of, of a sound premise, and everybody can get one. You like trends. And these long-term trends have been so successful for so many years because they capture the economic policy. You know, the, the Fed has been so good about the, developing these long-term trends in interest rates that we have been able to capitalize on that for 30 years. And that has been the biggest factor in all of these futures market CTA macro trend strategies. They've been driven by interest rates for so many years. And the, the interest rate policy then transfers to FX because if the dollar is stronger or weaker based on these interest rates, there, there's a major trend in the FX uh, relative to the dollar. And in, in a secondary way to... The equity markets, not quite as clear, but, but they do stimulate even though there's a, a serious lag in it. But the interest rates also then move into the carrying charges of all the other markets. So agriculture, while it has seasonality, will have this underlying long-term trend that will probably be up based on interest rates, which are carrying charges for them. So we've really been the beneficiaries of this Fed policy for a long time. 
and unfortunately, it's coming to an end. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me, but let me let me let you offer something here as you describe perhaps the foundation for why certain systems can work. You give the fundamental perspective, but discretion is not part of your toolbox. No, it's not. And, and it's just a matter of accepting the fact that these long-term trends will work most of the time, but not all the time. And when they don't work, they have, they produce losses and risk. And yet they're still sound and trends, the trends will reassert themselves. Right now we have a much more difficult problem for the industry in general because this long-term interest rate trend that drove the market for 30 years is no longer there. It used to be that the interest rate, monthly returns from being long interest rates, was always so strong that when you then added the odd trend from energy or from some of the other markets to it, you had a spectacular month. And the worst you'd ever get is a small drawdown due to the interest rates. It's not the case now. You're not getting profits from the interest rate sector. It's been the reason why CTAs and hedge funds that rely on similar stuff have really been struggling the last few years, that there are not enough strong trends in the other markets to make up for the disappearing interest rate trends. That leads into another subject that's near and dear to you, which are which are which are tail events. So you describe the situation right now, but but we both know that things are subject to change and quickly. And and not having a strategy to take advantage of those tail events is going to cause people great pain and harm in the future, I would think. Yes, it will. But the tail events are really a problem because a tail event is normally unpredictable. You're talking about mostly price shocks. Even though the, the shock may not occur in a single day, it could be a very fast shift in the supply demand, say, caused by Mideast issues with energy. And so you do get these very fast shifts and, and large risks. And I think that being unprepared for these things are what cause most traders to get wiped out. They don't have a, a true understanding of, of their exposure. And, and we've had these tail risks forever in the futures markets, not so much in the stock market. Uh, and by the way, uh, which is, what's your audience? How is your audience distributed so that I know if to talk about stocks or futures or whatever? <laughs> you know, it's a good question. There's a lot of them. I know that much. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you're fine to go in, in just about any direction, Perry. I mean, people are going to be familiar with you and they're going to enjoy hearing your perspective. And I don't think you really have to worry about catering it to anything. You and I will just talk and uh, the audience will dig in. Okay. All right. That's fine. But, but as I said, these, these, uh, price shocks are very common in the futures markets because they, you know, react to supply and demand. Uh, not so common in the, uh, equity market, but, but everybody's aware of 2008 and the subprime crisis. And that was certainly a shock. And it's a wonderful argument for systematic trading and for trend following. It was the best year that the futures markets have had in 20 years because they were able to go short. They followed the basic premise that when the trend turns down, you get out of your longs, and if you can, you get short. And most people with even reasonably disciplined traders don't do it as well as they should. They're looking for a reason why they shouldn't get out of the trade, that it's going to go back, they don't want to take the loss, then you have to figure out how to get back in. It's just, it, it just becomes a problem. Uh, you have to be disciplined, whether you're uh, systematic or algorithmic. Otherwise, these things just don't work. So in 2008, uh, and also if you go back to the technology bubble in 2000, people held on to their NASDAQ, you know, uh, positions, thinking that they would recover, and they never did. But any trend-following approach would have gotten you out reasonably close to the top. You would have saved 80% of your money at least. So if you're going to go into this, if you're, if you're going to look for systems, 
the most important characteristic you could have is discipline. And I think without that, you're always making excuses for a trade instead of just moving on to the next one. Take your loss, get out, go forward. Let me shift slight gears on you as we're talking systems. For those for those out there that are in their system building mode, and we're, if we're talking about parameters, and I've seen you say that from your perspective, you'd like to see parameters, similar parameters, working across most markets. And as you say, you, you prescribe, subscribe to the loose pants fit everyone philosophy. So why, why, do you ex, why do you explain the idea of parameters across all these different markets? Because because we're talking about some vastly different markets, and you're saying, hey, hold on, loose pants fit everyone. <laughs> yes, I, I am, and I believe that. First, I have to say, should we use an example of trend following? Sure. Which I think is conceptually easier for everybody. If you're going to first use trend following, then you have to conceptualize where it works and where it doesn't work. Uh, my own perspective, rather than making this a guessing game, my own perspective is that there are no short-term trends, that they appear to be trends because there's, there's news or an event that occurs that drives the market for a few days in one direction. That's not a trend for me. Uh, a trend is something much longer based on something much more fundamental as we talked about interest rates. But it could be a major shift in the energy supply demand. It could be the fact that the U.S. is now supplying more energy and there's a structural change in the world energy distribution. But first you have to decide, what are you trying to capture? And in my case, I'm only going to try to capture the long-term trends. I think, as I said, that there is something you could perceive as short-term trends, but they're erratic. Sometimes they're a week long, sometimes they're three weeks long, sometimes they're a month, sometimes they're three days. I can't capture that. But I can capture the trends that start with, uh, say, 60 days. That's four months, about four months and longer. So from four months up to, say, 200 days, which is a little less than a year, is a fairly sensible range. So that's the range I'm, you're going to look for if you're a macro trend trader. Now, so you want to test across the markets in those ranges and see that there's, that you are picking up some fundamental issue that it allows you to capture profits in those trends. They'll be quite different. In some markets, you'll capture a lot, like the interest rates, and in other markets, you'll capture very little. I don't care how much. I just want the number to be positive after a fairly long test to know that something Something is being captured because I'll use them whether they're really good or mediocre because they'll offer diversification in a portfolio. And, and that's a, also a different issue. So now we, we say, okay, we're going to look at the 60 day to 200 day range. And now we're going to test the market in that range. And I use a non-linear distribution because the difference between a 60 and a 65 day moving average is much greater than the difference between a 195 and a 200 day moving average. And, and you just perceive that by the percent difference. You probably won't see any difference in the trading signals you get between 195 and 200, but you'll see differences. Certainly if you went from 10 days to 15 days, you'll see big difference. So you need to distribute these in a percentage fashion. So if you're using 10% difference between the days, when you're at 60, the next one is 66 that you'd use to observe. But if you're at 200, the one before that would be 180, which is the 10% difference or close to it. So you need to distribute these, otherwise you wait your results towards the much longer end because you have an unfair sample out there. We, we do that and then you look at the surface of results and you want to see that all of them or my, my rule is that 70% of all of my tests and the test would be 
the trend speed, maybe a profit-taking level. I don't know if you use stop losses. I do. I don't. Depends what. But whatever the parameters are, and there shouldn't be more than two or three or four at tops, and you look at the results of all of those tests, 70% of them should be profitable. And that indicates robustness. Where I go from that, oh, and, and I want those profitable across a broad set of markets. I certainly don't want the, the 30 year bond to have 70% of the tests good and the euro dollar having 30%. A broadly diversified futures portfolio. Yes, but, but if I'm looking in the same sector, I want to get even more similar performance. If something doesn't match closely or reasonably well, there's something wrong. You've done something wrong somewhere along the line. It could be a simple programming problem. Uh, you could have used the wrong conversion factor. Your commission cost could be high. There, there are a lot of reasons, but there should be similarity in similar products. And then, yes, you also want to get robustness across products. And, and the reason for that is that when you move to a different product, it has a very different pattern based on its supply-demand history and the people who are trading it. So you'll get bigger swings, faster moves, more volatility, less volatility. And the idea that your system could work across not only different markets, but all of these different patterns is what gives you robustness. Because it, no matter how far back you go, if you were just to want to trade 10 year notes, uh, no matter how far you go back and look at the data, it has its own characteristic because of the participation. And it won't give you all of the patterns you need to know for the future. Nothing will give you all the patterns you need to know for the future, but the more patterns you can extract from different markets, the safer you'll be in the future. But, you know, just to, to drift a little bit, reality says that if your back testing tells you you can make 20% a year with, with a particular strategy, you should only assume that you'll make 10% because because of these unknown patterns that will occur in the future will not be as nice to your system as the ones you've tested. So to be reasonable, you should reduce your expectations by 50%. If the audience is paying attention right now, they, they should be hearing in your thought process uncertainty. There's just no certainty, so you constantly have to build in with the idea that something unexpected is going to happen. You just can't work with the idea that this is all going to be a straight line to profit heaven. Yes. Actually, the, the clearest example, for those that remember, was long-term capital. I'm sure you remember the events if you've read the book, what is it, The Smartest Guys in the Room? The, Lowen, the Lowenstein book? The Lowenstein book? I think it was, yeah. yeah the Lowenstein's book. You know, they decided that they were going to reduce, they were going to extract all of the risk and hedge out all the risk of all these various things, uh, aspects of their trade that interfered with the underlying premise. But what they did was they said that certain price shocks would never happen again. And so they extracted those price shocks from the data. And then they ran their strategy and surprise, their strategy made a lot of money with very little risk. <laughs> and so they leveraged it up as high as they could based on this, this theoretical amount of risk, which was almost nil. But we all know, you know, it's like government regulation. The government's trying to re going to regulate the market so that the events we had in the past won't occur again. Absolutely true. Some new event will occur in the future that we have absolutely no clue about, and it will cause at least as much damage as the stuff in the past. So removing these old price shocks just deceives you into thinking that you will have less risk in the future, which is not going to be the case. It's a good place as you bring up long-term capital management. Why don't you talk about, from your perspective, the idea, compare, contrast, define both, Risk management and risk measurement, because I think right that was the heart the heart of long term capital management's issues, perhaps. 
Yes, they, yes, they certainly failed in the risk management asset. But I know, I know risk managers, real life risk managers, that are pleased when after the company gets beaten to death, they can come back and tell you why it got beaten up. Well, that's not a big help. <laughs> <laughs> They, you're supposed to tell them before. <laughs> you know, it's that's the whole game. Is our business is one of understanding and accepting or embracing risk. We, there is risk in it, and you need to be very comfortable with that risk because it's going to happen all the time. And if you panic or if you don't plan ahead to have reserve capital or the right leverage, you're going to get killed. I, I'm sure that's why most people get wiped out, and they're in the market, and they do really well, and then they're gone, because they just underestimated the real risk of trading. When we're talking risk measurement, though, there's, there's I mean, for example, a, a sharp ratio is never going to be the greatest risk measurement to assess a trend-following portfolio. I mean, that's just not going to be, you know, you're going to constantly penalize any of that upside volatility. So why don't you talk about risk measurement from your perspective? Well, okay, let's just talk about the sharp ratio for a second. It does penalize. If, if a program were to have all upside shocks, which would be delightful, it would penalize it by saying, well, the risk is to the downside is the same as that which you've seen on the upside. And in all honesty, that's true, because I don't believe you can only have upside price shocks. You know that price shocks don't always go in your favor. And if you're getting them, that's wonderful. But at some point, you're going to get the opposite. So I really do believe that a standard deviation measurement like the Sharpe Ratio is a perfectly valid way of viewing it. The problem is that it's a probability. And it, it says that, you know, there's a certain percentage chance, like a 15% chance or a 5% chance that you'll see a drawdown of a certain amount over a certain amount of time. And that's true. But, of course, we don't know when it's actually going to occur. And because you've had a good, a good run doesn't mean that it won't occur next week. It's understanding what the numbers are telling you and planning for it. You really do need to plan for a price shock. And the, and the sharp ratio doesn't tell you that you shouldn't. It just doesn't tell you enough. For more sophisticated people using systems, you can use value at risk. Value at risk is a nice measurement. It's built into some software, but it tries to say that given the history of the way prices have moved and given the portfolio that you currently hold, this is the chance that you will have a unpleasant move tomorrow. Okay, But it's still like everything else based on price history. And so if the price history over the past six months or year doesn't reflect a price shock, a serious price shock, then it's going to undervalue your future risk as well. But it's still a, a very nice measurement, and it's different from a sharp ratio. I consider it very valuable. I saw a comment that you had uh, noted a while back you had been doing well for a client and the client said, hey, I'll accept less profit, Perry, if you can just eliminate the risk. <laughs> yes. Yes. It wouldn't that be nice. And I'd love to do that. It's a real misreading of the entire issue of risk, though, isn't it? That he even it might have been a very smart man for all I know. And, and it's, it's a complete misreading of what risk even is. Yes. He was smart in a business sense but not smart in a statistical sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you have to understand the numbers as well as understand business. But let's just talk about these high volatility trades versus low volatility. There are some interesting issues for traders because you trade in low volatility scenarios and you trade in high volatility, and people often try to decide, am I making more money? Do I need to take this risk because all the profits are in the periods of time when the market is really moving around? And it turns out to be the opposite. 
by the way, I say the, I say these as facts, but these are things that I have learned with my work over time. Somebody may come along and, and differ in opinion, so I can only tell you what I believe, but I, I, I tend to state them as facts. They're not always facts. Let's just look at my experience in low and high volatility trading. One of the problems with low volatility trading is that it does make money steadily, and it's a wonderful time to trade, but you're usually under-leveraged. And so you tend to make less than you would like to make during those periods. So you have to keep your eye on volatility. And when volatility is low, you have to trade larger positions to bring your exposure up to a certain target level of risk. And the futures market, they do that by calling it target volatility, and they target, say, 12 to 14 percent, which is related to a standard deviation. So, so one standard deviation of volatility is 12 or 14, and that's how they come to that. But the the underlying issue is that when you're trading the stock market or you're trading the futures market and volatility is low, you need to trade larger positions and measure your daily risk so that you're keeping your daily risk somewhat constant. I mean, you don't want to add one share or ten shares each day to, to bring it up, but, but when it starts getting out of whack by 20%, then you want to bring your portfolio up. Otherwise, you're going to be disappointed with the, with the results. And again, you've got this all defined algorithmically. This isn't guessing for you. This is all pre-done, pre-set before you ever get involved. It's it's all built into the program automatically. It measures the volatility of the returns every day. When, when those returns drop below a threshold level, it rebalances the portfolio simply by adding shares or adding contracts to the portfolio. As I said, if you don't do that, you underperform. And these periods of low volatility can go along for quite a long time, and you can underperform for a long time. So your history says that you're going to make 12% a year or 14% a year, and you're making 6 or 7 and your system's performing perfectly. You're just managing it badly. So, again, so now let's move to the other side. The other side is high volatility. And and it's true, the market moves really fast during these periods. And you now have to find out, when, when the market moves fast, your risk is higher. Am I getting the return that I want for the amount of risk that I'm taking? So if, my vol- if the volatility has doubled, then my risk has doubled. Has my return doubled? And the answer is generally no. Your return is far under the level of risk you're taking in these extremely volatile markets. So if you cut the position size during high volatility periods, you bring your risk back under control and your ratio of risk to return improves. Not by a lot. But I think it's a good trade-off because I don't want to add that extra level of risk to my program. I just don't need it. That most of the money is going to be made in the lower volatility markets by leveraging my positions up. So I'm going to do the opposite in the higher volatility markets. And that turns out to be the best trade-off, I think, for certainly for portfolio traders as as we are. Now, you're being very understated, but the concept that you just outlined for the audience is core. I mean, this is this is foundational. This is very, very important. This is every fiber of your trading system being is what you just described. Well, again, it, it goes to survival. You know, it, it, you, you have to be there to keep trading, and you have to you have to play the situations to your advantage. And it's to your advantage to leverage up in quiet markets and to leverage down in extreme markets. And you have to stay on top of that. And of course, for leveraging up in quiet markets, you can do slowly because they last a while. But when things get really volatile, you want to leverage down pretty fast. 
2008 would have taught you that. The market started to implode. You needed to reduce your position size. Even before you got out of the whole position, you needed to reduce it just based on the volatility of the, of the market. So, so yes, I can say that, you know, you can tell in the talking about this that I put at least equal weight on the risk management as I do on the underlying system. They, they are both important. It's, it's hard to turn an underlying system that doesn't make money into something that does make money. But you can turn a profitable underlying strategy into a loser by not managing it correctly. You know, I would encourage all the listeners to pay much more attention to the risk of what they're doing. So here I am in Southeast Asia right now, and I've traveled Asia extensively in the last year and a half. And so the idea of emerging markets, could you compare and contrast from your perspective using algorithmic trading systems, trend trading systems in emerging markets? Because there's a good portion of my audience that's definitely in emerging markets. Can you compare and contrast these types of systems that we're talking about today established mature markets versus the emerging markets and some of the differences the audiences might want to be aware of. For example, I know there's plenty of people listening to me that are in Brazil, uh, Indonesia. So it's a variety of people in a variety of different types of markets. Yes, actually, that's an interesting question because there is a very distinct difference between a U.S. market like the S&P and an Asian index or a South American index, it turns out that emerging market, say equity index markets, and, and perhaps the stocks as well, I would think so if the index reflects it, that they are much more trending than our markets. There, there's a phenomenon that goes on as markets mature, where more and more traders come in for different reasons. And they're buying and selling all over the place, some just getting out because they want money, some following systems, some fundamentals. And it makes the markets like the U.S. and European equity markets noisier. And by noisier, I mean they make erratic movements. There's an underlying trend, yes, but there's a lot more erratic movement in that. In the emerging markets, the lower participation re reflects the fact that the actual participations are more commercials and not individual speculators that often have the same opinion. And you find that the market moves in the same direction for many more days than it would in the U.S. market. And so the trends are, are much easier to capture. And the trends, you can use a faster trend-following approach. And you can watch the maturity and the evolution of these markets by which speed trend is working. So that at first you'll be able to make money with a 10-day moving average. And then as more participation comes in, you move that to a 15 or a 20. And as the trends get longer, they reflect the fact that the trends are trying to avoid the increasing noise in the market. You can trade emerging markets with much faster trend-following approaches than you can the U.S. market. The trade-off for that is the liquidity. By definition, it means that they are not as liquid, so you can't trade positions as big. But individual speculators probably won't care because they're not going to trade positions so big that it will make a difference to the market. No, I think you're definitely inspiring people around the world with that perspective. Yeah, it's just, you know, as, as a large-scale portfolio manager, I can't trade individual stocks or something. I can't trade in big numbers in some of these markets because the liquidity is just not there. So it, it opens up the door to individual speculators. You know, we have to wait till there's enough liquidity. Hmm. Hey, Perry, so listen, uh, for the audience, as the author of 12 books, if they can't figure out how to buy some of your books, then probably uh, we, you know, they, if they can't get on Amazon and figure out Perry Kaufman and, and one of your great books, then they're, they're a lost cause. The new firm with Mark and Tim. So where can, we, where can we direct people to to check out what you're up to right now? If they have questions, they can direct them to Tim. That's Tim Tanko is key... Tanko, T-A-N-K-O, 
at amphi capital, A-M-P-H-I capital dot com. The systems that we're using are there, they are institutional versions of the ones that are on my website, which is kaufmansignals.com. So they can look there and get a feeling for the underlying strategies that go into this. If they, they want to have their accounts managed or institutional or just ask questions, they can direct the questions to Tim. We'll be happy to answer them. If Tim can't answer them, he'll direct them to Mark or me, and I'll answer them. So they'll get done. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today. It's good chatting. Hey, where are you today? Are you in an interesting spot today, too? <laughs> uh, at this moment, I'm in, in the Bahamas looking out over a marina. That sounds like a good spot to be looking out over. It could be worse. <laughs> so it, just like you, it's a bit hot and a bit humid. So. Oh, the, 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 it's, it's a hard living. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, Perry, it was, it was good chatting. Hopefully we can talk again in the future and maybe even dig a little bit deeper. You, you really, uh, I think, gave some great perspective for the audience today, and I, I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, no, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money and up down and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.